Please, thank, thank you very much. Please, please be seated. Shalom. It's wonderful to be here with you all this evening. I want to begin tonight by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we gather, Gadigal and the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. I want to acknowledge also, Stephen has just mentioned, our veterans or any service personnel serving who are with us this evening and say thank you on behalf of our nation for your service. To Stephen and, and to Judy, your leadership of this amazing Karen Haysford organisation, the UI, UI Board of Trustees, World Board of Trustees, is a, a testament to the esteem in which you are held globally by the Jewish community. Your leadership here in Australia and your family's leadership here in Australia is among, in the pantheon of, of great contributors to our nation that have built this country. And as a nation, we're deeply grateful to you and for the wonderful work you're doing now. To Lance Rosenberg, the president of the UIA Australia, thank you so much. To Gillian Siegel, lovely to see you, Gillian, president of the Executive Council of Australian Jury, thank you for your leadership. To Ambassador Jonathan Pellet, the acting ambassador of Israel, it's wonderful for you to be here tonight, as you always are amongst the community, Your Excellency, and it's wonderful to be joining uh, with you here this evening. I'm joined by some of my colleagues here tonight. One of them I'm not joined by tonight is the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. You may know him. <laughs> in fact, I suspect about seven of you are in text communication with him right now, <laughs> and that you didn't initiate it. <laughs> Josh is a dear friend and a great colleague, and he's doing a tremendous job as he prepares for his next budget. But amongst all of that, there has been a very there's been a passion project for Josh, which I want to acknowledge amongst the community here this evening. And that is the work that he has been doing to provide funding uh, for Holocaust museums. Those we know of already here in New South Wales, an, outst an outstanding museum. In Victoria also. But the $20 million that we worked together to ensure was provided to support the museums in South Australia, Western Australia, Tasmania, Queensland and the ACT. That's important, but I'll tell you what's more important. That means across the whole country now, Holocaust education will now be taught across the curriculum. No better way to remember than by teaching your children. And I want to commend Josh for his leadership. <laughs> to Stuart Robert, the Minister for a very long list of things, Employment, workforce, skills, small and family business. Um, another great friend of Israel who's here with us tonight, and you know Stuart very, very well. Dave Sharma, the member for Wentworth, who's here, a former ambassador to Israel, known to you incredibly well, doing a wonderful job in the community. And uh, Julian Lisa, who's here with us, the member for our, and Joanna, it's wonderful to have you here. I'll talk a little bit more about Julian uh, in, in just a second. To everyone else who went to Sydney Boys High School who's here, I know there's a lot of you, because <laughs> I went to school with you. <laughs> it's wonderful to be amongst friends. Tonight I want to talk about a, a topic that I know is very dear to you. My father um, was a big believer in community. He was Mayor of Waverley, he was on the Waverley Council for some 16, 17 years. And he taught me a lot about the importance of community. And he learned it all from you because my father would tell me, if you want to understand community, understand the Jewish community, which he loved passionately and dearly. And, uh, and they cared for him uh, at Walper in some of his last months. And my mother was recently cared for there. She's fine, by the way. She just had a back operation. But um, <laughs> the care, the community of the Jewish community has deeply impacted my family, and, uh, and, and my father taught me that. And so I want to talk about a topic tonight that is dear to your hearts, community, community of individuals. We heard it on the video, a nation of individuals. Now, as some of you may know, I, and as Stephen has mentioned, I ha have been deeply influenced in recent years by the writing of the late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. And Julian is responsible for that because he has thrust as Jonathan Sachs works into the arms of anyone he could get a book into the hands of. 
rightly so, and I'm very grateful that he did. And on one occasion, he said, because I was consuming this, uh, that you better be careful, you might become Australia's first Jewish Prime Minister. <laughs> and I said, don't tell Josh. <laughs> <laughs> But his books, Lessons in Leadership, Covenant and Conversation, Morality, his last work, have given me a more textured understanding of Judaism, my own Christian faith, and what unites us all as human beings. And I shared some of these learnings with my own church community last week at the Gold Coast with Stuart Robin at their national conference. And in his works, Rabbi Sachs wrestles, a bit like Jacob, wrestles with the practical complexities of our modern pluralistic world and finds through the tenets of his faith, as he did, a pathway to the common good. At the heart of our Judeo-Christian heritage are two words, human dignity. Everything else flows from this. And seeing the inherent dignity of all human beings is the foundation of morality. It makes us more capable of love and compassion, of selflessness and forgiveness, because if you see the dignity and worth of another person, another human being, the beating heart in front of you, you're less likely to disrespect them, insult or show contempt or hatred for them, or seek to cancel them, as is becoming the fashion these days. You're less likely to be indifferent to their lives and callous towards their feelings. Now, those of Jewish faith understand this. As Rabbi Sachs said, the purpose of Judaism is to honour the image of God in other people. Reflecting the psalmist, people who are fearfully and wonderfully made. Such a beautiful idea. And it's one shared by many other faiths, including my own. Appreciating human dignity also fosters our sense of shared humanity. Now, this means that because we are conscious of our own failings and vulnerabilities, we can be more accepting and understanding of the failings and vulnerabilities of others. True faith and religion is about confronting your own frailties. It's about understanding your own and our shared humanity. And the result of that is a humble heart, not a pious or judgmental one. Now, this has been my experience. It has also been my privilege to appreciate the commonality of this view and my ever-deepening con connections with so many other faith and religious communities across Australia. Christians from all denominations, the Eastern Orthodox faiths, Maronites, Catholics, Anglicans, and then of course Judaism, Hinduism, Muslims. Seeing the dignity in others means we can see others as imperfect people striving to do their best. And you know, in a liberal democracy, and there's no greater liberal democracy than the ones that are shared here and in Israel, human dignity is foundational to our freedom. It restrains government. It restrains our own actions and our own behaviour because we act for others, not ourselves, as you indeed do here this evening. That is the essence of morality. De Tocqueville agreed. He said, liberty cannot be established without morality, nor morality without faith. Hayek, the economist, said the same thing. Freedom has never worked without deeply ingrained moral beliefs. Acting to morally enhance the freedom of others ultimately serves to enhance our own freedom. So it's no surprise then that Rabbi Sachs concluded in his final work, morality, if you lose your own morality, you are in danger of losing your freedom. The implication here is very important. Liberty is not born of the state, but rests with the individual for whom morality must be a personal responsibility. In Lessons in Leadership, he quotes the distinguished American jurist, Judge Learned Hand, to argue his point, who said, I often wonder 
whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws and upon courts. He said, believe me, these are false hopes. He said, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women and when it dies there, no constitution, no law can save it. Freedom, therefore, rests on us taking personal responsibility for how we treat each other, based on our respect for and our appreciation of human dignity. This is not about state power. This is not about market power. This is about morality and personal responsibility. Now, morality is also then the foundation of true community, the place where we are valued, where we are unique, where we respect one another and contribute to and share one another's lives, where we pledge faithfulness to do together what we cannot achieve alone. Sachs describes this as the covenant of community. Determination to step up and play a role and to contribute, as you are indeed doing here this evening as part of this amazing organisation. Not leaving it to someone else, to another. That is the moral responsibility and covenant, I would argue, of citizenship. Not to think that we can leave it to someone else. But there are warnings. Where we once understood our rights in terms of our protections from the state, now it seems these rights are increasingly defined by what we expect from the state. As citizens, we cannot allow what we think we are entitled to to become more important than what we are responsible for as citizens. Teddy Roosevelt argued this more than a century ago in his famous Man in the Arena speech, but I'm not going to quote the section that is most known. arguing that going down this path of entitlements of citizenship as opposed to the responsibilities is a very dangerous one. And it indeed jeopardises national success in a liberal democracy. He said, the stream will not permanently rise higher than the main source. And the main source of national power and national greatness is found in the average citizenship of the nation. He said, in the long run, success or failure will be conditioned upon the way in which the average man, the average woman, does his or her duty. First, first, in the ordinary everyday affairs of life and next, in those great occasional crises, and we know a bit about that, which call for heroic virtues. Now, together and individually, we are each responsible for building and sustaining community. And we each have something unique to bring. Because pe community begins with the individual, not the state, not the marketplace. It begins with an appreciation of the unique dignity of each human being. It recognises that each individual has something to offer and that failure to appreciate and realise this as a community means our community is poorer and it is weaker. In short, to realise true community, we must first appreciate each individual human being matters. You matter. You, individually. And in this context, I would also argue we must protect against those forces that would undermine that in community. And I don't just mean, as I've recently remarked, the social and moral corrosion caused by the misuse of social media and the abuse that occurs there. But I would say it also includes the growing tendency to commodify human beings through identity politics. We must never surrender the truth that the experience and value of every human being is unique and personal. You are more, we are more individually, more than the things others try to identify us by, you by, in this age of identity politics. You are more than your gender. You are more than your race. You are more than your sexuality. You are more than your ethnicity. You are more than your religion, your language group, your age. All of these, of course, contribute to who we may be and the incredible diversity of our society, particularly in this country and our place in the world. But of themselves, they are not the essence of our humanity. When we reduce ourselves to a collection of attributes or divide ourselves even worse on this basis, we can lose sight of who we actually are 
as individual human beings. In all our complexity, in all our wholeness, and in all our wonder. We then define each other if we go down that other path by the boxes we tick or don't tick rather than our qualities, skills and character. And we fail to see the value that other people hold as individuals with real agency and responsibility. Throughout history, we've seen what happens when people are defined solely by the group they belong to or an attribute they have or an identity they possess. The Jewish community understands that better than any in the world. So my message is simple. You matter. You make the difference. You make community. And together with family and marriage and the associations of clubs and community groups, faith networks, indeed the organisations we're here celebrating tonight and so much more, they are the further building blocks of community on that individual, providing the stability and the sinews of society that bind us one to another. And upon that moral foundation of community, we build our institutions of state. Within that moral context, we operate our marketplace. To your great credit, this event is an affirmation that morality always starts with individuals, seeing the dignity and need in each other and deciding to act. You are demonstrating by your own actions that morality can never be outsourced because when it is, we rob ourselves of that precious agency and we deny the strength and goodwill that comes from building community. You matter, community matters. In a democracy, it matters especially. It's a tremendous source of strength and it's why foreign actors seek to sow discord online in many other ways. And flaming angers and hatreds and spreading lies and disinformation. Of course, the right to disagree peacefully is at the heart of democracy. I'm not referring to that. But democracy is a shared endeavour. And the civility, trust and generosity they are the currency that mediates our differences. As I said to the Australian-Israel Chamber of Commerce in Melbourne a few years ago, in the aftermath of the Christchurch massacre, which broke our hearts and tore our souls, what we need is not to disagree less in a liberal democracy like Australia. We just need to disagree better. I've been so incredibly heartened to see people from across the country show the best of us as a nation this past year, as Teddy Roosevelt said, those heroic virtues that were called upon at such a time. Drought, bushfires, floods, cyclones, pandemic. Australians have found ways to support each other and stand with each other, checking in on each other, keeping jobs, there for your employees, volunteering, helping neighbours with their shopping. Tonight I've spoken of Rabbi Sachs and I think his description of community could be well applied, I think, to the best of what we've seen in Australia over these past few years. There's another Jewish leader who's also influenced me in re recent times and on this occasion it was Josh Frydenberg thrusting the book into my hand. And I know he's had a big impact on Josh and I know I would say everybody in this room and that's the Holocaust survivor, 101-year-old Eddie Jacu. Eddie's book, The Happiest Man on Earth, is a gift to us. I think he's taking the title of what I might have called my book at some time. But it is a great gift to Australia. He is a great gift to Australia. The book is a love letter to this country and I thank those of you who have come up to me tonight as Prime Minister, not me personally, but just representing the Australian nation and saying your thanks to what Australia has meant to you and your family. Of course, Eddie's story is harrowing, but it's also hopeful. Of life in the Nazi concentration camps, of surviving Auschwitz, Buchenwald and the Holocaust. And of course, losing his family, but never losing his faith in humanity. Finding friendship, even amongst the absolute ruins. And after the end of the war, Eddie found a home here in Australia where he was welcomed with open arms as so many 
of you or your family have been. Many of you know Eddie because he's guided tens of thousands of people through the Sydney Jewish Museum. Eddie says of our country, a land where opportunities abound, and it is. Julian Lisa has made the wonderful point that Australia is one of the few places on earth where Jewish people have not suffered persecution. We're not perfect, no country is, but we do have much to be proud of. We are a liberal free people, one of the oldest continuous democracies on the planet. We have an indigenous heritage and a rich multicultural character, both adding a brilliance and joy to our national life and character. We seek to be a good neighbour in our family here in the Pacific and a good citizen in the world, playing our part, doing our share of the heavy lifting, meeting global challenges. We stand as a sovereign and free nation in an increasingly uncertain part of the world. We value and strive to preserve a liberal world order where the strategic balance favours freedom always. And we stand by with like-minded friends, such as the Jewish people and the State of Israel, who've, who is a great friend to Australia and we are a true friend of Israel. A country that is sovereign, that is independent and free. A modern state, born anew in an ancient homeland. Australia is a proud and faithful friend. So friends, continue to stand by each other. When President Rivlin visited Australia, he described Australia's Jewish community as the living bridge between our two countries, and that is indeed what you are. You have created a bridge that has enriched Australia beyond measure. Though numbering only about 1% of our population, Jewish, Jewish Australians have made a remarkable contribution to our national life and our story. You have sought to be a light under the nations performing uh, the mitzvot or good deeds according to the law of Moses. Good citizens, good neighbours, good friends who understand through your own faith and history and sufferings that life is not about what you accumulate but what you give, what you contribute. People like John Monash, Isaac Isaacs, Sir Elman and Lady Cowden, Linda Dessau, Susan and Isaac Wakel, Judy Kassab, the amazing Sir Frank Lowy, Izzy Lieber, the late Izzy Lieber, who we know passed away early this month. And our thoughts and prayers are with his family. He was a great blessing to this country. My dear friends and my Deputy Leader and Treasurer, Josh Freigerberg, another great contributor, as is Julian Lisa, making his mark. So many astounding, outstanding Jewish Australians. So many stories of giving back. So that's what you're doing tonight. I know Stephen is hoping the focus on that is giving. <laughs> but you will, I know, because that has been your custom to give and to give back. In my church, we talk about blessed to be a blessing. And that's what you're doing here tonight. And so being among you tonight, I feel I'm deeply honoured to be here. I'm deeply grateful for your contribution to our nation. I honour you as Australians and as people of a rich heritage, a great culture and a tremendous faith. And I take to heart the words that you live out. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. So I conclude with the words of Eddie J. Koo and his blessing to so many. May you always have lots of love to share, lots of goodwill to spare and wonderful friends that care. Thank you and God bless. Shalom.